everybody. How's it going? I am VV Magic, and I'm here today with two very special guests that the VV community has not heard from yet. They're going to share some of their great insights, other projects that are involved in the crypto world. Uh, it's going to be a really great, exciting conversation. So without further ado, I want to welcome Sam and Joey. Hello, fellas. How's it going? Hi there. Happy to be here. Yay. How's Thanks it going? How's it going? Um, so to preface, we sort of met back in, what was that, like January, February? Had a had a call together. It was like it's about it's about ten years in crypto years, it was <laughs> something like that. It was it was it was not that long ago. That feels like forever ago. It really does. Um, so Sam and I have known each other for eons, um, and he's known that I've been involved with Vivi, and his buddy Joey. Um, he found out also had delved into Vivi a little bit, and I think we sort of like got in early and then set it aside, and then you kind of checked your portfolio during the bull market and you're like wait a second what's going on and so we had this conversation and got to know each other a little bit and um I just thought it'd be uh fun to get you guys on and get your perspectives yeah I'm, uh, by the way I'm so I'm an OG of VV that I have the username Joey on VV so that was that's how early I, I was basically like one of the first people that came on and I was so happy I got the name Joey so you know I'm excited to be here you're basically the only person I know who is very knowledgeable and locked in on VV that I, that, so I, I like talking to you and I feel like you have a lot of insight about the VV verse and about the future and about the project and about the founders and right. the kind of like this energy for it. So it always gets me excited he hearing what you got to say about VV. So I'm excited to, to talk more with you. And obviously Sam, he's pretty locked in on the whole NFT world right now with all the work he's doing. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear what you guys got to say, because I don't really know anyone in real life that likes NFTs, right? Like most of my friends, they're all, I'm in the poker world, so everybody's in the poker world. I don't like have NFT conversations pretty much ever. So <laughs> this is, uh, this will be fun for me. So thanks for having me. Do you happen to know what your date was that you joined VB? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I found it during the, after right around NBA Top Shot was, uh, was basically like blowing up. Or was that like, maybe like last, I don't remember when that was, I really uh, but basically right after two years ago. So right after that, I was like, okay, let me go look around. Let me see what else I can invest in because it seems like these NFTs are going to be really valuable. So I started looking around on Twitter for other NFT companies. And that's when I found BB was like the first one I found. And that was maybe like January or February, about two years ago. Nice. Uh, yeah, you beat me. I'm uh, March timeframe of, uh, what was that 2021? So can you guys, we'll start with Sam. Can you give me a little bit of your professional background? Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll kind of try to guide it to where Joey and I intersect and all this. I'll say too, I know basically nothing about VV. I'm kind of everywhere else. And that puts me in the best position here and that I'm just here to learn from you people much smarter than I am. So excited <laughs> to be here as well. and looking forward to, uh, to talk and shop with you guys. Uh, yeah, so my professionally, I, I previously worked in poker like Joey did and does. Uh, I ran a company called Poker Go, which does streaming production and distribution of live tournaments and events. I'm based here in Las Vegas for that reason. I've kind of bounced around to different things. I've been doing a lot of angel investing. You could consider it doing a lot of crypto investing for the past few years, doing some consulting for different companies. And then early part, a bit like you both, early part of 2021, I started dabbling in the NFT space. And there's been obviously a lot of pretty big storylines from the world. I'm, I'm in a couple of projects like Board Ape Yacht Club, CryptoPunks, and a few others. And that's it's fine and dandy and fun to you know trade JPEGs around and see the massive amounts of money uh, being shipped away and being made and lost in, in short spans of time. But what really captivated me, which I think resonates a lot with what Vivi is all about, is around the IP and community that community that can be derived and developed from digital fan experiences all made possible by NFTs. So that was really, when I worked in poker, that was one of my big problems was, you know, our, our directive and why people paid us money was the content that we created on our poker channel. And ultimately what we strive to do was super serve a passion audience and poker fans. But our core metrics and our core KPIs were based upon TV ratings, which are about the most funny number or anonymous figure ever coupled with like streaming concurrent viewers where you know the volume of interest you have, but you don't know anything about the people behind those numbers. Like how can I create an offering that's more compelling 
and more engaging to the fans that we're building this business around. And NFTs in a way, it's a bit of a meme to say this, but NFT solved that in my mind, where you, you turn customers into community and through that community, you have a direct feedback mechanism, a way to super serve that audience and get to know that audience better such that your entire business stands to be better for it. So that's what got me into the world. Uh, and I, I had my business hat on in the process. And that's what I've been doing for the past year and a half since then is doing consulting work, uh, brand building for different IP partners, holders, clients looking to take the leap into the NFT space and, and do, like I said before, as I like to think about it, turn customers into community through these digital fan experiences. Very well said. I love what you had to say about community and being able to get this group of people and then and then the company is then able to take that feedback because that's something VB really takes to heart and is passionate about is listening to the community and getting community feedback so they can make the experience better they can make the product better um and so that's that's like to their core like part of their core values so that was awesome that you're in line with that as well all right what yeah about you, absolutely Joey? what's your what's yeah. your professional background well, just to add on with sam just because i know sam a little bit better than most people are going to know sam so I, I could probably give a different intro for him about what he knows right now, but he actually did a real great event. We did this uh, for Poker Go, right? He mentioned he he basically like came out of college, started working with Poker Go, which is one of the biggest companies in our industry, the poker industry. And uh, it can't be an easy first job out of college, so right? So kind of going through that experience and learning from that is a very unique way to start learning about the online world, the, the, just the whole online ecosystem, online content. I mean, it's a different kind of world. So, but yeah, he just did a great event for the, for the Poker Go NFT. They had this big event at the state at the Poker Row Studios. It was pretty fun. I went there. I met like, I met all these different NFT people. I met. It was uh, it was actually a really great time. So kind of what he said is kind of what he, what I just went to one of his events. So it was like my first ever NFT utility, and I was like, oh, this is this is a different. You know, it's pretty cool to be able to own something, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we got an event. We're giving away money. We're giving away a party. Like we're giving away this opportunity to meet people. So I thought that was pretty cool, but. Uh, kind of about me. I've been playing poker a long time since I was a kid. I'm 37 now. I started when I was about, um, and I started pretty young, but I started playing online when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I just basically grinded, focused on poker, dropped out of, stopped going to college. My mom didn't like that, even though that was kind of before poker. But yeah, she in the background now. She makes dinner. She not. I'm, I'm visiting her in the Midwest, so she not uh, happy about that. But I basically dedicated my life to poker. Became one of the best players online. Used to do all these challenges. And I always really shared my story. I started blogging, like writing my journey in 2008. And then I basically just did this for 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 19, 20, basically until maybe like two years ago during COVID. So I played poker online, lived all over the world. I started doing a lot of YouTube content seriously in 2014. So I always had a YouTube channel and a blog and everybody kind of follow, like the best, best players in the community, people kind of follow, they like follow their story. They go over the hands they talk shit about you they talk about nice about you right so that's kind of like how the poker sort of like community works in some ways so i always wanted to be the best i always wanted to be one of the best players i always wanted to be like, like an ambassador of poker so i kind of worked my way up there had my roller coaster of ups and downs in the poker career started doing content started making a podcast learning about how that whole world works built up my channels on youtube on twitter and instagram um i just been doing poker for so long right since for podcast since 2014 now and it's 2023 so i basically had everybody on the show i've edited, done a lot of my own videos investigations live streams played a lot of poker pretty much done everything in poker that i ever dreamed about doing commentary work with a lot of good great companies uh work with poker go multiple times doing commentary i had think i had one of my show, my first shows on there, major wager on there behind the poker row uh, on there as well too. So, I mean, really like it feels like a crazy whirlwind, right? So I've been doing that for a long time. And then that's why I met Sam, right? When he started Poker Go, I was one of the first people that he really started to meet in the poker world when I first moved to Vegas. So he's basically been a guy I've known in Vegas for about six years, you know, always really great time, great person to hang out with, to real work with, to kind of follow his journey as well, just to kind of, you know, talk about how I know Sam a little bit. And then you know, I got into NFTs, like I said, during the Top Shot stuff and during COVID, because I started following, start studying money and like, what is money? Like, what is fiat? What is Bitcoin? Like, what are these fucking people talking about on poker? Like Twitter, what is this Pompliano guy spamming Bitcoin, hopium every day? Shout out to my guy, Pomp. But why is he spamming this every day on Twitter? I was like, what the hell is going on here? So this is when I started learning about it. I started studying it. I started hanging out with a mutual friend. 
of me and Sam's and he does a lot of investing and he was like having investing calls. And I was like, damn, what is this? Sound, this sounds like a lot of fun. I never even heard of this before. Like investing, I was like, I never heard of investing at all. So I'm like looking around at different assets, what to invest in. And then NFTs came out and I was like, damn, this is like, this is pretty sick. Everyone's hyped up. They're all making money. Uh, I know NFT would be a good prop, good solution for my own, my own thing, what I do with content, because I got a lot of followers, a big community. And basically an NFT is like a digital product that your that your community can have and then get a lot of value from forever, basically, right? And then there's the whole like asset value work. There's a bunch of other things I kind of thought that it solved perfect for me. So I said, okay, well, this is going to help out a lot of other brands out there too. So I started searching around, found Top Shot. A lot of my poker friends were getting into it. And then I found VV. And I didn't really understand that I should have just bought a lot of shit. I was like, oh, I don't really know what to buy. You know, like Sam was saying, Sam was doing like crypto pumps and a lot of people were doing board apes. And I'm like, I was like, I don't know about this guys. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know about <laughs> what the hell's, I don't know what the hell's going on. This is just, I didn't know. I didn't fire into a lot of those projects, but VV was one of them. Uh, another one of the companies I'm invested in, Taunt Battle World's one of them. And then like Pudgy Penguins, I like those guys. And then, uh, you know, Poker Go's got their NFT. So that's kind of like my NFT experience has been mainly focused on what those four brands are doing. Because I worked with Taunt Battle World uh, for about six months and I'm still working with these guys. We actually got an event tomorrow. We're doing a new drop uh, the 14th. So uh, yeah, it's one of my investments and and uh, I'm hyped about that too. It's a long-term project, but yeah, kind of long answer, I guess, but hopefully that great that summed it up a little Love bit the bios and i'll i've got your your links for your socials and everything in the description so everybody can uh follow you guys and and uh connect and find your youtube channel you have a pretty big following on youtube right joey yeah i mean i got about one hundred fifty-five thousand on youtube i like twitter the most i got like 81k on twitter and then ig like 44 45k but i don't really i've never really tried to get subscribers on youtube or ig before twitter i i have i've done a little more things that are a bit more you know, let's build the following a little bit, but YouTube, I don't really, uh, I've, I've kind of been off YouTube for the past couple of years. You know, I, I sporadically hop on, I'll do a big series. Like I'll do an, an investigation recently that kind of went viral on poker, but I, I just kind of, I don't like YouTube as much. So I, I like Twitter a little bit more. Yeah, I get you. Um, and so are you guys also, well, I know Sam, you are, um, what kind of cryptocurrencies are, are most appealing to you? Either, either one can go first. It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll take it first. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really doing much in cryptocurrencies right now. I, I, I had the, the phase of getting involved in the, um, I'll call them poop coins for a while there, <laughs> and never, and, and never really, uh, never really attracted me. There's this, it's, it's very much like a, a, a precarious game of getting out at the right time with some of these things, and I prefer to invest in real tangible use case and quality of, of assets. So I'm heavily in Bitcoin and Ethereum basically is, is the magic two and primarily on, on Ethereum. And then I'll do some, I don't know how technically we want to get, but some layer two type stuff off of Ethereum, uh, AVAX, Polygon, uh, Arbitrum, stuff like that. What about you, Joe? Are you into crypto much? Uh, I'm into crypto, I guess, is the asset in terms of if I want to invest in it. Uh, Bitcoin, I love Bitcoin the most. I mean, the other ones, you know, everybody got a good argument for a lot of these different cases in terms of, you know, a lot of the tokens that I've studied are associated with like real world players that are connected to, you know, legacy financial system, right? So those are kind of like my favorite projects that I might look at. But in terms of investing and putting my actual capital into Bitcoin and Ethereum are two of my favorites. And uh, in terms of like the future, you know, I think that the whole financial system is basically going to change. And I don't really know where Bitcoin fits in there. I don't really know what regulation is going to be, but I just know how regulation can drastically change the industry because poker got regulated in 2011. And then it, you know, ever since then, it went from one way to the completely different way altogether in America. So i uh, not really sure what to anticipate on that. So, but what I have followed closely, I'm basically studying Bitcoin, study money every day, trying to just understand a different way to think about money and a different way to think about assets and value and accumulation. So I kind of set out a new path after I started learning about investing to be one of the best investors in the world. And I don't really know exactly what that is going to mean yet, but you can kind of see your thought process shift every day that you reframe and you try to say, okay, I want to get out of this poker only mindset, get into or content only, or get into more thinking of it like an investor and then looking at the different assets and then deciding, okay, what do you want to put your capital, your resources or attention into? So I'd say with the crypto stuff, um, 
I don't know. It, it's interesting a little bit, but it's not as interesting as a lot of the people on Twitter. I feel like made it out to be. It just seemed like a big fug, and a lot of people, you know, were running some classic Fugazi hustles to make a lot of money and take advantage of a lot of dumb, dumb money. You know, kind of like how poker works a lot of ways too. So I understand it completely. But it just seems like a completely different realm of what's possible because you got these people making trillions of dollars, billions of dollars. You know, it's just you know, kind of makes money seem like a joke at this point in time. So that's kind of a little thoughts, I guess, on that kind of stuff. One thing I want to point out that you said that I love was um, uh, doing your research, that you spend a lot of time doing research. And that's where a lot of people get into trouble, especially just getting into NFTs or cryptocurrency and just, you know, finding whatever's hyped and just thinking, okay, that's going to make me money. And, and they, they get either rugged or they lose a lot of money or sometimes they get lucky, but you know, the, the best advice you can give somebody when getting into this industry is to do a lot of due diligence and research so that you can protect yourself as much as possible. There, yeah, there's no, a really important theme there. <clears throat> Sorry, Joe, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. I, I care what Sam's going to say about this stuff. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I, there's an important theme there, which will resonate deeply with Joey around being results oriented and thinking about there's there was a period there in let's go let's narrow on nfts in particular but it was a general bull run but like that the summer of 21 where pretty much any nft that was released ended up popping off and what, what it created was this sense of this sense of i guess almost untouchableness like anyone like it was it was such easy money that everyone was good at it but when everyone is good at it no one is good at it in a way and further i think we we've underestimated the impact of luck on all of this and this happens in poker as well where sometimes the cards go your way and you go on a hot run for a while there and and you maybe even you win a tournament and all of a sudden you feel like you're the best player in the world but in fact there was just a few things that happened to go your way on that particular occasion that have skewed your thinking. And I think that happened a lot to a lot of people during the last market cycle where when everyone's winning, everyone thinks they're a genius with their investing decisions. But when those investing decisions aren't made with a thesis in mind or research behind it, then they're still bad decisions. They just, you just got lucky in making that decision. So it's just an interesting parallel. Some, and, that's, and I think that's maybe why Joey and I have really gravitated towards things like this. And a lot of poker players do at large because the psychology of poker gameplay, things things like results orientation and um, making optimal decisions and uh, expected value and things of that nature and making individual investing decisions have a lot of impact in this space as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to follow up with that, that was one of my questions is, is what, what sort of parallels do you see between poker and crypto and NFTs? Is there, are there other things that sort of come to mind? Joey, you take that one first. Uh, poker, crypto, and NFTs. Well, it's kind of stuck on the on the last question, and then maybe we, we can get to that. Sam actually wrote an article on LinkedIn about that. Uh, I told him he should uh, write more write more LinkedIn content about why poker and NFTs are similar because I never really <laughs> thought about it before. So that was actually uh, the only time I started comparing poker and crypto because I, I kind of think about that a lot. Uh, but I kind of want to go back to the last one you said about the we're doing your research, right? Oh, yeah. And for me, here's when I realized that when I started investing in the altcoins and my first altcoin investment was in the great OMI token, which we all know OMI token is connected to our beautiful app TV. And now when I'm reading through the white paper over and over again to try to understand what exactly the OMI token does, and I realized that the, basically there was billions of it and it had absolutely no tie to what was happening in BV. And I'm saying, how could this be worth anything? And how could any of this stuff be worth anything, right? There was like a game called Townstar. We all got into all my friends. All, we all got shielded into Townstar, right? And with Omi, basically <laughs> when I invested in Omi, it went up 7X from when I first got it. So I put in 30K and then it went up to like, I was up like 200,000 within like a month. And I said, oh, like, well, it's probably just going to keep going up to like a dollar. You know what I'm saying? I had this like 1,000X, 10,000X. Like, I didn't know what the hell was going on with this. Didn't take any profit. Obviously it all, it went back down to the original entry price and then I sold it all. So I didn't make any money. I only lost money. And then I went into Townstar. My friends did the did the research. Went into Townstar. We went up three x on that right away. And of course, you know that all went back down too. So I said, okay, man, hmm, I don't know what is going on here. And that's actually my inspiration for working with a cryptocurrency company. I've never, I haven't had a job in a long time like that. I've done a lot of partnerships and contract work and stuff like that with companies over the years. But 
I really wanted to get some insider experience working with a corporation, working with people who have corporate experience because the founders, they got used to work at Amazon. They're like long-term corporate guys. They know the whole corporate game. And then I want to learn like what's going on with these assets. How does the NFT prices work? How did the crypto tokens work? Like how, what is, how is a different way to think about that? So my research led me to get a job with a company to figure out that perspective of things. And then, uh, you know, so I'm like all about the research. I love studying. And the main thing I found for my investments is that if you can have a relationship with the people that run the company, that can be a pretty valuable thing because then at least you have more insight into what's happening. But yeah, with the whole NFT crypto asset stuff, it just seems so, you know, there's so many different directions you can think about it, right? If you're thinking about it, trying to make money, you know, we don't really know at this point in time because we know the regulation is going to be so. Uh, but yeah, I kind of guess going back to your next question, which was related to poker and crypto, what parallels do I see? I'm curious what Sam's got to say about that. And then I can kind of follow up on what he thinks about that. Well, I'm just, I'm still laughing at the town star thing. Cause you say that your friends did the research and yet I am friends and I thought other friends did the research. So clearly uh -oh. there were some missteps in this process. Someone, everyone else thinks that someone else did the research, but I suppose that's, that's the, the core of the problem here and, and why, and why, and why things transpired as they did. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, that is what it is. It's another podcast for another time. A great time, great time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, it inspired um, me a lot. I said, man, someone's making a lot of money here. And I got to figure out who those people are. And normally it's yeah. the people that start the project. So, yeah, it is what it is. Well, I mean, all, all that being said, I, I back to the back to the question on parallels in, in poker and, um, and NFTs and crypto at large. I think the biggest one for me, I already touched on a little bit. I think another big one for me is around... I guess risk management, which hmm. Joey can attest to this as well. Um, back, you, you could you could compound the issue that I previously touched on regarding having a, an elevated sense of your ability in the investing game as well as the poker game. And in poker, sometimes that manifests itself as maybe taking bigger shots at higher stakes, even if your skill set may not match the other people at the table such that your expected value is expected to be positive and thus you become a losing player at higher stakes which means you lose money very quickly it's very similar in the investing game i think where everyone has a limited big role of what they can invest and if you start taking shots on assets that are above really your comfort zone and those don't work out, you lose that bankroll very quickly. It's, it's very much a game of, of, especially in the current market cycle, surviving and not getting in over your head on any singular asset or even asset class. And they I mean, it, unfortunately, you see that happen a lot in crypto where especially the most ardent believers tend to extend themselves mightily in terms of their percentage of net worth. And then when you see a cycle like this, there's a lot of pain and suffering because of it. So that's, I, I, I work in this space. I'm a firm believer in this space. I am a diehard fan of the space. And I have never put in more than like 10% of my net worth, just understanding the risk that it entails. And I think that's important for people to consider. Like you can, you can be, I guess, I don't want to say hesitant, but you can be careful while also being a firm believer. Like both, yes. both can be true. You can be precocious while also, you know, having, having full faith in, in what could be with this crypto world. Well said, fully agree. 10%. 10% yeah. I mean, that's how most people are not 10%, right? I mean, think about poker when I, you know, playing poker, I'm always, I've always been, or when I was kind of coming up, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty high risk in terms of the shots I would take. And I see a lot of crypto people I know. I mean, my God, a lot of my crypto groups, a lot of these guys seem like they got most of their money in it. You know, they're like, they got most of their money in the OMI token. Some of the groups I was in, in terms of like the OG, OMI holder, VV people, like a lot of these guys seem like they had a lot of their net worth invested in NFTs and in the token. And, and I think Sam's right, right? If you're playing by like traditional theory and you're thinking about how do I, how am I going to spread out my allocation and what my investments are? You know, he, there's a lot of other investments out there that are probably worth your time to be paying attention to or be putting money into. Whereas crypto, to me, seems really high risk, high reward. The volatility is high. The time frame might be long. You know, like with these VB NFTs, I could have taken a profit on a lot of them and done really well. I think my collection was like higher five figures at some point in time. But now, you know, I got, I got to think I have a couple blue chips, but obviously all of those are down because a lot of the different investments besides the ultra rares or secret rares, or like the first drops, 
you know, a lot of those middle tier assets were doing pretty well for a time, like the flying, the first flying one, the yellow, what is it called? The little yellow fig figurine was like selling for $1,200 at one point in time. I think now, you know, pretty down from that point in time. So, you know, you could say, okay, I should I take a profit? Should I not take a profit? Like what, how to think about it? You know, what exactly, like I'm still sort of figuring out, I think a lot of people are figuring that out. And I think a lot of people probably put a lot of their money into that point in time, right? So, uh, but I guess poker, right? Poker to me is about game selection and then repetition. So you have to be able to find a good game and then you have to just be able to keep playing in it. So mm -hmm. certain people are able to do that in like a live casino. Certain people are able to do that in a certain online poker site or an online poker room or an online poker club. So, you know, I kind of think about investing in that same way where you have all these different possibilities out there in the world and then you got to decide okay well what game do i want to play and where do i want to put my energy and where do i want to put my focus and where do i want to put my time and then how do i want to think about you know adding value to that potential asset i own and, and those type of things like that so those are the kind of areas of things i've been thinking about or how poker and those go together because you know we all have this this unlimited amount of energy that we can choose to focus. So, I mean, if you're obsessed with BV every single day, or if I'm obsessed with like my Omi token every single day, then uh, my energy is not being somewhere else. You know, so that's been my kind of challenge to figure out, you know, what are the things I can take away from poker that are really going to apply to this game of investing. And there's really like so many different areas you could focus on that. I'm still in the early stage of learning that myself. I'm about two years in now, but yeah and that's and, and i think games game, just to echo that game selection i think is an important one because yeah in 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 poker you would consider like what stakes you're playing at who's at the table what casino you're playing at is like choosing the game and in, in investing it could be based upon market dynamics so i actually i calculated this for a linkedin post late last year but like q q1 q2 of 2022 i believe i bought and sold like 250 different nfts well unfortunately didn't sell them all but bought 250 individual nfts and then q3 q4 i bought three so it speaks like i i think i think a a willingness and ability like that's that thing investors especially like retail type investors tend to be very all or nothing with their approach where it's I'm going to degen into these NFTs, but then if it's not going my way, I'm going to take my ball and go home and not engage with it at all. But you can, you can be involved and active in the space to Joey's point, whether it be research, whether it be helping with the assets you already own, researching new assets, exploring platform level stuff and, and different project based stuff for investing versus individual NFTs without necessarily needing to actively buy, buy, buy all the time. And that's, and that's, that's where my focus has been personally is not necessarily playing the game of NFT buying and selling for the time being because of current market conditions, but putting focus, time, energy, research into other facets of the space. Nice. So shifting gears a little bit, um, what are your guys' thoughts? Um, so we see this m mostly on VV, but there are other platforms that are connecting with some of the big IPs around the world. But what are your thoughts of you know, these huge companies like, you know, Disney, MGM, uh, Marvel, you name it, getting involved in this NFT space. I mean, what are some of the pros, cons, just general thoughts that you have about that? I get, I could take that one first. I have a lot of thoughts. Sam loves the IP stuff. This is, this is like, uh, I feel like this is his favorite part about the whole NFT stuff, right? Is figuring ideas yeah. out. How do you, how do you, how do you, build idea how do you build something new based off of this new technology and new way of thinking about an asset yeah it's 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 fascinating because you have this i think of it as like this arms race between native and non-native ip in nfts so let's take on one hand you have like board apes and others versus disney marvel and all of those in in reality and it's 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 this bit of a catch-22 because None of these blue chip decades, centuries old brands want to be the first to take that plunge, especially now, but everyone's kind of dabbling in it, but the new IP can take the quicker lines, further risk and get to market quicker and do more innovative things in the space than others can. However, the former of the two being the Disney's of the world, 
the, there's a big theme around NFT storytelling and involving community in the future of the IP and, and, and letting the community tell their own stories. I think there's a big play in like fan fiction here, which historically has been a lot of, a lot of the big IP publishers have been very anti people monetizing their IP through, through their own native evergreen storytelling, but NFTs serve as a way to allow communities to tell their own stories out of the IP. That's a side subject, but these, these IP holders have decades upon decades of a head start in creating and nurturing that fan community and that affinity. All it takes is the flipping of the switch to say, now we want to put this IP in the hands of our community, in the hands of our customers, whatever it may be. Now that in and of itself is a bit of a scary proposition, especially when you look at IP that's very family friendly, like a Disney, where it, it, Disney has spent millions if not billions of dollars on protecting that IP over the years. So to then put that in the hands of others is a bit of a scary proposition. And it's, that looks like a number of different things. Like I don't, I don't say put in the hands of others in a way of like copyright usage and allowing them to create businesses like you would see with board apes and whatnot out of the IP itself, but inherently in taking these IP, taking this long time IP that people have a great love for and passion for, from decades upon decades of enjoyment, putting that into these new frontiers and mediums is is very scary on the brand part of things. So it's that's a that's a long answer that that really answers nothing. In that, it's <laughs> it's been fun to watch it all play out because I think I think we're at this sort of precarious stage now where it's like, um, you know, everyone wants to do something with it but doesn't really know what that looks like. However, even the attention has drifted from the mainstream in the current market climate, but. I believe, like, I, I just saw this, like, on a call right before this. So I, I didn't even read the details yet, but, like, Amazon just announced Avalanche as their, like, blockchain partner for, for their future Web3 initiative. Where it's like you're seeing the Amazons of the world continue to keep this at, at the forefront or at least on their purview, where, sure, mainstream attention has somewhat gone by the wayside, but, like, Starbucks is rolling out an NFT-driven loyalty strategy all these different major blue chip brands are continuing to not necessarily directly engage, but build for the future in this space, which continues to have me really excited. And certainly things like VV and the stuff that Disney's doing there qualify for this to the, to the most extreme extent. Yeah, I want to touch on that really quick because um, you made some really great points. So you answered the question perfectly, actually. Um, that that's been a huge thing with VV um, and the community is. The community is so hungry, especially the people that have only been in VV, but know what Board Apes does and represents and, and hello, <laughs> and, and where they're going, they, they want that utility so bad and they're so, <laughs> so cute. I love it. <laughs> and they're like, That's my why aren't we there yet? Why, why, why aren't we doing what Board Apes is doing? And it's just, it is such a big company and they have so much to protect. And I mean, mm -hmm. They have a whole Walt Disney Studios is basically all legal now at this point. They have a whole studio lot of legal. You know, there's so many, yeah. there's so much red tape. There's they don't understand the space. I mean, they're learning is that the same space that we're learning, right? And so, you know, they I I think this is speculation, but I think they understand the importance of utility, but they're still trying to map out how they can do that, but still protect their IP, their brand, all that. So I'm really glad that you touched on yeah. that. What about you, Joey? What do you think? <laughs> oh yeah i mean i love i love it yeah i think uh i think every brand's gonna have an nft you know what i mean i'd have an i think i'd have an nft right now but it's kind of looked at in my world as you you know kind of like a risky kind of it kind of it doesn't have a very good mainstream appeal right now people look at nfts as a scam they look at nfts as like a big joke kind of seems like to me but like sam's saying everyone's getting an nft everyone's gonna have an nft everyone's gonna be involved in nft every company's gonna have some version of nft because it's just such a great revenue source, really. I mean, if you can understand how to how to build an NFT program, then you're gonna be able to make so much money and you're gonna be able to give back so much value to your customers. So it's like a no brainer for everyone to have an NFT. Um, you know, the one yeah. thing that excited me about, about Vivi was actually because the only reason I know about IP is because of poker. So poker go used a strategy to build up where they, uh, 
acquired some of the legacy IP, which was high stakes poker. They started working with World Series of Poker, started working on Poker After Dark. And that was a real, so they were basically trying to create original content at first, which is one of the first shows that I did with them. So they were trying to create original content and then they acquired partnerships with this legacy IP that was the, basically the most popular brands in history of poker. And then they were able to have that content and eventually they got to understand, okay, well, what's their best usage of this content? How can we, how can we build up our original IP through this legacy IP, which they've been doing very well. And that's exactly how they've been building their strategy. But this shit's taken so long for them to do now. I mean, they've been going on maybe like eight years, nine years now. So when I look at what BB's doing, I'm not like, I'm not impatient at all. Like I'm here, this is a long play. All these companies, it takes time to build a brand. It takes time to build a real community. Like my community year one, when I'm making content is way different than it is year six and year eight. And most people think that you just start making a community and like you do some discord for three months and like shit starts happening. And that's not how community works because I got one of the most engaged communities in poker and it just takes so much time, so much repetition. People go through life experiences with you. They evolve with you, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when I look at VB, I mean, this is just, everything's going to happen. You know, it doesn't matter what Board Apes doing. Literally, it really doesn't matter at all what any of these people are doing because all the space is going to look so different in a year and two and three. And uh, VB already has the ability to have, they got the IP God, right? The guy in the IP Hall of Fame. These guys are intellectual property partnership experts. So if they can pull this off with Disney and Disney, you know, they seem like they have a trusting relationship with BB and it really comes down to that partnership that you have with your collaborator. When I think about giving out my IP, if I'm going to give out, uh, you know, my brand to a poker, poker company, I'm going to go with someone who I know who's running the company. I know that person. I've known them for years. Like I trust that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Not everybody's going to be like that, but I think a lot of IP is going to think about their brand like that when they're licensing things out. So that's going to give a big advantage to people who already have those built-in relationships and they've had it for 20 years in other parts of the world. So when I look at that, I, I think that's interesting. And then I love what like something like the Pudgy Penguins is doing, where Pudgy Penguins, they were acquired by a guy named Luca Nets. He brought in a new team and he took that dead project that was basically like a rug onto, you know, started building up the original asset and then started building out this this kind of like a Disney strategy where they have these products and they have all these different things that they're trying to put that IP into sort of like competing with the Disney at some point in time, right? Like it kind of becomes a competition because there's only really so much, I guess not really, right? Cause there's so many distribution factors now for content. So maybe, it, you know, it isn't competition in some ways, but I find that part of how people are using their IP interesting. You know, what real world products will they create? What real world experiences are they going to create? Like how can they tie that into with their, digital community and then how can they bring it all together? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, gotta, I can go a lot of different directions with that. There's an important point there. And it's, it's so, so one of my, Joe, I think you, you, you know him as well, um, a buddy of ours named EJ. He, um, he basically heads all the special projects at Illumination, which is the studio behind like Despicable Me, Secret Life of Pets. They're doing the Nintendo movie, all of that. And we've, I find it fascinating to talk to someone like that who is like in charge of this, very powerful IP and and how it's exploited across various mediums. And we talk a lot about this Web3 world and blockchain, NFTs, the metaverse and stuff like that. And we actually had a conversation yesterday, which is why it's fresh. And we what we what we talked about is how there is like, I, I don't know if anyone else gets this, but I get major anxiety over how many TV shows and movies that I have to watch. And I say have to loosely in that you always get recommendations and you have to watch the show. You have to see this. You have to subscribe to Apple TV. You have to subscribe to HBO Max and all these things. And there's just so much content and activities and games and things that are vying for your attention. It's so hard to get people to give a crap about things. And that's ultimately what this is all trying to do. It's all of these NFT platforms, these communities, they are vying for your attention. Anything of entertainment value is vying for your attention. And I think we underestimate how difficult that is in the current landscape of all the distractions that we have taking up our time, energy, resources, and so on and so forth. And that's ultimately what all these projects today are competing with. Why should I spend time pursuing collectibles versus watching Netflix or playing Call of Duty or doing these, all these other things I could spend my time doing 
and that's kind of the that's kind of the crux of the position that we're in right now and what what i'm curious to watch for in the coming months is like how how do i think we're at that next stage like the we no longer can rest on our laurels of saying i care about this because it's going to make me a bunch of money and i think it's the next stage is that utility aspect like okay now now what what is this what is this asset that i possess what is that going to do for me and the value is to be derived from that experience versus the potential roi itself if that makes sense mm -hmm. you've literally yeah, led into my next question <laughs> which is what is the purpose and need for utility with NFTs? Why do we need it? 